Hi, I'm James Bier, MDC Shining Bright Spotlight on Black History Month. And to talk about Black History Month, the one and only, someone that I truly admire. I spent a whole weekend reading his book and learned so much about it. We are truly honored and delighted to have with us Brendan P. Fleming, thank you so much for being here. My good brother, thank you so much for having me, man. They told me it's like a 10 minute drive, like from where you are to here. <laughs> Just, uh, maybe 15. <laughs> <laughs> 15, that's great now, but we are really honored to have you here oh, man, and to I'm talk good. about Miseducated, that book. I just stated, you know, over the weekend, uh, you start reading the first chapter and you're like, there's no way you're going to skip what's happening next. Yeah. Um, first, I want to say thank you. Thank you for saying it the way it is. Yeah. You know, no filter explaining that story. You stated, you started from the bottom. Rag bottom, you made it your bed. Yeah. You almost killed yourself. Yeah. Let's talk about the book. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that chapter. Absolutely. You know, I found myself in a place where um, I was without hope. Yeah. And, um, you know, one of the things I mentioned in the book is, you know, finding yourself in a place without hope is, is like being in a black hole. You know, there, there's nowhere to go. And, and it seems like you're, you're just kind of just, just stuck. And, and I didn't know how I was going to find my way out of that place. And, and it seemed like I was just um, stuck with suffering for the rest of my life. And, and I tried to take the easy way out. You know, I, I did not have any sense of purpose. And, and, and I think a lot of people struggle with this because when we don't feel a sense of purpose, we, we don't feel like there's any reason for us to exist. And so it was like my, my being here has no impact. Um, nobody will miss me if I'm gone. Um, I have no reason to continue to fight, to continue to struggle, you know. And so as a result, you know, I just wanted to end my own misery. And, um, but, but thankfully, I, I was not successful. No, I appreciate you uh, tackling a very important topic, you know, mental health issue in our community, yeah. especially black community. Um, it, it's so moving because we are still dealing with things yeah. like that yeah. inside of our own community. You yeah. know, let's talk about the motivation. What motivates you to, to say, you know what, it's time to write a book. I have to write a book about it. Yeah, I, I think what gives us the strength to keep going is when we finally reach a point where we feel like we can repurpose our pain. Yeah. And, and, and that means that, that all the pain that we've experienced in life, um, a lot of times we're asking why, like, did it really take all of that? Did I really yeah. have to go through all of that trauma? Did I really have to go through all of that, you know, struggle? Um, and, and the answer is yes. And, and the reason why is because what I want people to realize in this book is, is that the things we go through are not about us at all. They're, they're always about the people that we will someday be used to reach. And so that, that is when I, I found my motivation uh, when I realized that, that the struggle was never about me, um, that the struggle was always about empowering me to be able to empower and equip somebody else. And so I, I had to write the book. You know, I had to write the book. I had to tell the story. And, and it was a very difficult book to write, I'm gonna be honest with you. You know, there, there are people who, who oftentimes ask, you know, when, when you wrote the book, did it bring a sense of healing? And, and the answer is no. You know, I mean, sure, I, I could lie and be like, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I wrote the yeah. book and it healed me. So you, um, you went through depression while yes, writing the book while, because while you had to revisit you, so many I mean, difficult moments. You have to understand my family and I have never talked about these things. We, we've never had any conversations. And so here, here I am, you know, calling my mother, my sister, my brother and saying, hey, I want to talk about this, but, but not just to, to talk about it between us, but to share it with the world, <laughs> you know. And, and so my, they were apprehensive at first, but I told them I had to. Yeah. I had to because that, that's the only thing that will make what we went through worthwhile is if we can make somebody else's life better. Um, by using our pain to empower somebody else. And so that's why I told the story. You know, my story is not unique. You know, there, there are so many other people who have the same story, who have been through this. I'm not an anomaly. Um, I'm just the one who has been fortunate and blessed enough um, to have a voice, uh, to have the words, to be able to articulate a very common plight, a very common story. 
And, and that's the story of young black men in America. Miss Educated, you call it a, a memoir, a book, but to me, it's a, it's a source of motivation. Yeah. You know, it's like a mirror of spirituality, you know, yeah. uh, the social issues that we are dealing with in our community. We look at it and say, this is what we're dealing with yeah. and how we make the changes, right? You say it in the book, you are not exposed to scholar, black scholars, right? You're exposed more to a, a basketball instead of a book. Yeah. How do you think that would have changed your life if you had that opportunity to see, now you're on TV, to see black scholars yeah, on TV? Yeah, yeah. Um, how would that change your life? It would have changed everything because representation is the lens through which we dream. It's the lens through which we aspire because people cannot be what they cannot see and, and they cannot be what they cannot imagine. For me, I couldn't imagine a, a black scholar. I mean, to be honest with you, back then, man, I thought scholars were corny. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I, I thought they were goofy looking. You know, I thought if, if you told me to draw a picture of a scholar, <laughs> I would have probably drawn an old white man with, with glasses and, and a beard, you know, because that was the image that came to mind based on how I've seen it represented. That doesn't look like me. That doesn't sound like me. But, but when I look at Michael Jordan, he looks like me. You know, when I look at Allen Iverson, he sounds like me. You know, when, when I look at rappers, they come from where I come from. And, and so I had access to them. And so it made sense, you know, because during, you know, adolescence, we're going through this period of, of, of um, imitation yeah. where, where we're trying to find ourselves. We're trying to find our identity. And, and usually our identity is constructed by the various factors that we have access to. You know, we are comprised of, of our experiences and the people who are around us. That's why I call this book Miseducated. It's not because I was uneducated. I was not, un I was educated. I was educated by the wrong things. Yeah. You know, I was, uh, I was in a different school, you know, what we call the school of hard knocks, yeah. you know. And so what I was taught about blackness, what I was taught about manhood, it was violent. And so I thought that in order to be a strong black man, I, I had to assert my dominance through violence, yeah. not through brilliance. And I never saw that practice and it would have changed the world for me. It, it actually did change the world for me uh, when I was finally introduced to something different. You know, when I was in high school, I, I encountered a, a black male educator for the first time. It was an interesting experience because um, he wore bow ties and, yeah. and he wore fitted suits. And, 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 and I used to ask him, I'd be like, hey man, why you talk funny like that? Yeah. You know, because I thought yeah. that's only how yeah. white people talked, <laughs> you know? And he's like, what do you, what do you mean why do I talk? I was like, why do you, you know, use all those words? And you know, how, how do you do yeah. that? And yeah. he said, well, I, I majored in English. And uh, that man is the reason why I too majored in English and the reason why I wear bow ties. Wow, absolutely. Stay with us, Brandon. We're gonna take a quick break. When we come back, we'll talk about a very troubling kid from the streets and now to Harvard University. We'll be right back. Learn and earn today at Miami-Dade College. College graduates earn 56% more than high school graduates and a million more lifetime earnings. A degree from MDC is your path to greater earning power and career success. Choose from hundreds of affordable high-tech and in-demand career programs, including cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, business, and nursing. Learn and earn today at MDC and fast track your career. Enroll now at mdc.edu slash purpose. Welcome back our conversation with uh, Brennan P. Fleming from Harvard University, uh, talking about his book, uh, Miseducated, should I say, there is to me, it's the reflection of um, so many black men still dealing with this issue that you are talking about. At a very age, in the streets, you're exposed to gang, looking for identity. And the, the beauty of what you said in the book is, many times, and I figured out it's the same, right? black men, we are not too happy to see a black man. We don't say, yo, brother, what's up, man? All good, you know? It's more shoulder to shoulder, right? He's not sharing that love. Yeah. I wanted you to talk about that search, you know, of your true identity. You gotta be tough, you gotta be raw, instead of 
sharing love instead of sharing that compassion, instead of speaking the language of love. There are two things that are common about every single one of us. Well, one is that we are all looking for acceptance. Mm -hmm. No one wants to live without love, you know, however we interpret love to look like. And for me, I was also guilty of the same thing that every single one of us at one point or another in our lives have been guilty of. And that is I was looking for love in the places that were willing to give it to me. Mm -hmm. and, and for me, that was not school. For me, that was not home. You know, I didn't have teachers who loved me. I didn't have, you know, parents who, who, who loved me in the way that I needed to be loved. I grew up in a very abusive home that was filled with drugs and violence, you know. And so when I found love, it was, it was in the streets, you know, because finally I had people who were willing to accept me for who I was, yeah. you know, and, and, and they affirmed me. And, and they, they called me their brother, you know? And so it, I wasn't inherently bad, you know what I'm yeah. saying? Um, it's just, I was looking for love and I was willing to conform in order to get it. And, and that's what so many of us do, re regardless what the dynamic of the relationship might look like. And so it created unhealthy relationships for me, you know? And, and, and growing up around cousins, you know, who, who were um, educated by the streets, you know, they then educated me. They became my teachers. You know, the teachers who I was willing to listen to because they sounded like me. The teachers I was willing to listen to because they looked like me. Um, unfortunately, um, they misinformed me about who I was supposed to be. And, and I thought I was supposed to be violent. You know, I thought black men were, were only athletes, yeah. you know? And so it, it wasn't until I saw something different that I thought I could be something different. Yeah. In our community, there is that sense, and I wanted to know if you felt that at that time, you know. There's a lot of people around, but very few, few people are really there for you. Yeah. At a moment in the book, you talk about rage, right? You feel that, you know, like everybody's against you. This is the moment for you to, to show your anger. Yeah. Do you feel that, that part, that sense, like, you know, like they are all around, but they're not there for you? Brother, that started for me very early, you know, when I was a child and um, I was subjected to the abject abuse of a man who was a Baptist preacher by day. By night, he was a cocaine addict and he tormented me. He tormented my siblings at a time where I did not know how to ask for help. I, I didn't know how to articulate my pain. I needed somebody to see it. But, but in order for someone to see it, they had to care. Right. And so I went to school and, and teachers wondered why I acted out. It, it was a clarion cry for help, you know, like and, and I wonder why was no one interested in saving me? You know, so, yes, I was surrounded by so many people, um, but but nobody took the time to ask the right questions, you know. And, and as a result, it, that's when um, it, it created and birthed this rage that made me angry with the world. Um, and so I lashed out, you know, I acted in anger um, because I didn't know what else to do. You know, as a, as a young black man, I didn't know how to channel, you know, my, my feelings and my emotions in a constructive way. And so as a result, um, I did so with violence. Wow. And that didn't turn out pretty good for you. <laughs> it didn't turn out good for me at all. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it turned out pretty, pretty bad for me because I, I, I not only was a hazard to myself, but I was a risk to everyone around me. I, I risked my mother's career um, in the military, you know, which is very strict, you know, and um, it was our livelihood and, and the decisions that I made, you know, drug peddling involved with gangs, you know, it, it put us all at risk. Um, but, but at that time, you know, I couldn't think about anything else but what was right in front of me, yeah. you know, um, because I wasn't taught to think long term. I wasn't taught to think about the future. Um, we were in survival mode, and survival mode um, can be emotional, you know. And, and so for me, um, I, I didn't think about those factors. I, th I thought about, you know, what, what made me feel accepted in the moment. You would agree with me as black men, we have to wear multiple faces or multiple masks, right? Um, the way we speak in the streets is not the same as Harvard or, you know, on, on TV. And I realized that miseducated it's like the raw version of <laughs> Brendan, right? It's like, I, I feel like I need a, a platform to say it all. 
yeah. and a platform to teach other students not to get into the same mistake that I did. Yeah. Am I right? You're, you're very, you're spot on. I was very hesitant to write the book the way that I did. Um, because at the time it's like, I teach at Harvard, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. like, yeah. I, I don't know if I should speak, uh, yeah. in such a colloquial way, you know, in yeah. such a raw way mm -hmm. with, with the language that's used. Um, but I'm going to tell you why I did. The, the reason why I did is because I knew that if this story was going to be told, that I had to tell it truthfully. Not, not just the narrative, but, but to give you and the rest of the world an intellectual, a psychological, and an emotional window into what it looks like in the life of somebody who's lost. I need you to feel that. I, I, I need you to hear that. I need you to know the truth. If you say you really care, um, maybe you've never seen my world. Maybe you've never been a part of it. But, but for these couple of pages, I can bring you into it for a moment. And, and, and I can allow you to feel what it feels like. I can allow you to see what it looks like. And, and it's only in that moment that, that we will be able to create change because oftentimes people find it difficult to appreciate the things that they cannot understand. And, and so for me, I wanted to give people an opportunity to really understand my plight and the plight of so many other young black men in this country. Yeah, and also for so many young black men to let them know that there's hope. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amazing. Stay with us, Brandon. We're gonna take a last commercial break. When we come back, we have much more to know about that book, for sure. We'll be right back. Learn and earn today at Miami-Dade College. College graduates earn 56% more than high school graduates and a million more lifetime earnings. A degree from MDC is your path to greater earning power and career success. Choose from hundreds of affordable high-tech and in-demand career programs, including cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, business, and nursing. Learn and earn today at MDC and fast-track your career. Enroll now at mdc.edu slash purpose. Welcome back to our last segment, Brandon. Miseducated, that book right here. There you go, just in case if you haven't get it right here. Perfect, encourage you to not only purchase that book, but also to read it page to page. Very, very important. I wanna talk about managing space mm. because sometimes we're looking for our identity and the languages yeah. that we have to speak in different platforms and how a black man can really identify himself in different places. How you use that uh, space to know, okay, I'm at Harvard, this is the way I have to, to manage myself, to behave if I'm in the street. Like you said, you, you had the first scholar, right? You're like, you speak funny because you didn't understand the language of that. Yeah, I think our ability to connect with people is, is contingent upon our ability to be multilingual. Mm -hmm. and, and and I don't mean in a literal sense of, of yeah. actually knowing, <laughs> you yeah. know, multiple, language. but yeah. but knowing multiple cultures. Um, I am effective as an educator because I know how to speak the language of the people that I'm trying to reach, you know. And, and I think for a lot of times that there, there's an impasse that that prevents us from being able to reach people and, and connect with people because they don't find anything about us that, that is similar, mm -hmm. you know? And, and so for, for me, it's, it's teaching even the young people that I teach how to navigate different spaces. You know, growing up for me, you know, we oftentimes ne never left the community that, that we grew up in, you know, so we didn't mm -hmm. know what the world looked like. And, and it's not until you leave that world that you realize that 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 the world is is a lot yeah. bigger than, than what you <laughs> yeah. thought, um, and, and you're able to learn not just more about other people, but you're able to learn more about yourself. And, and so that's why I think it's really important to be able to connect with people by being able to culturally, you know, speak their language, to to be able to care about the things that they care about, and ultimately be able to meet people where they are. Yeah. Another thing that I really like about the book, uh, Miseducated, is the way that you, you are educating the community, the black community, about who we are. Yeah. Like blackness is not a weakness. Yeah. 
Yeah. You know, a scholar is not coming in a box. You know, you could have a different uh, um, characteristic to define a scholar in our community. Yeah. I wanted you to talk more about that. Bob. Yeah, there, there, there are so many people who perceive us of being incapable, incompetent, inept, because we need the playing field to be level for us. Right. You know, there, there are people, you know, th this is a time where we're where people are on the fence about things like affirmative action, where where words like equity have become divisive um, because people say things like, oh, well, you know, I don't believe in handouts or or, or, or I don't believe in, ju in just giving people. I, th I think people just pick themselves up mm -hmm. by their bootstraps. Yeah. But what about people who don't even have access to boots? So 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 this is not an issue of 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 aptitude. It's an issue of access. And that's what we have shown people by taking these young people from inner city Atlanta, you know, from under-resourced schools, training them for one year, sending them to Harvard to compete against 400 of the most gifted young scholars from over 25 countries around the world. And five years in a row, our students have won that competition. How? How? What, what does this send a message to, to the whole world? It's that anything that black and brown people have not achieved is not due to ability. It is only due to access. When you give people the access to resources to better themselves, that is when you will bring the best out of them. And is that not what we're all called to do as leaders? As leaders, we are called to bring the best out of people. The only way you do that is through equity. And I thank you a testimony of that, recognizing by Forbes for the work that you are doing at Harvard University and also how you are motivating that community to do that. I wanted to say congratulations on that as well. If you want to touch base on the work that you are doing at Harvard University. Yeah, absolutely. So we, you know, I set out to do something very radical back in 2017. I had a conversation yeah. with my um, administration at, at, at the university, um, at the Harvard Debate Council, and, and we have several hundred students who study on campus every summer and compete in an international wow. debate competition. And I told them I wanted to recruit black students from, from Atlanta and, and train them and send them to the university to compete. And um, there were concerns about that because it's like, but, but how are they gonna compete when, when these kids studying at Harvard coming from the Phillips Exeters of the world and the Hotchkisses and, and, the, and mm -hmm. the Choates, you know, all these schools where they've had access to this type of training all their lives. How are these kids from under-resourced schools who are considered underprivileged gonna compete with them? And I said, I'm going to make sure they're ready to compete against the rest of the world because I'm going to level the playing field from them in one year. And when they get here to Harvard, I'll make sure they show the world what's possible when you are willing to meet students where they are. Um, and they've done that. They've done that consistently five years in a row. Um, five different cohorts of students that we've trained in Atlanta have won that global competition. And so it sent a resounding message to the world uh, of what is possible for us you know, when, when you are willing to, um, there's something called latent learning. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a psychological term in, in education that says true talent does not surface until it has an incentive to do so. And, and honestly, I think that incentive is love. I think that incentive is when, when you are able to show young people uh, a certain level of love and, and compassion, um, it encourages them to perform because they realize that what we perform is bigger than us. Winning the debate competition at Harvard, it's bigger than us. It's about our community. It's about our responsibility. And one of the things that I tell people all the time is that, you know, I don't want my greatest achievement that people talk about to be the fact that I made it to Harvard University. I want my greatest achievement that people talk about to be that when I made it to Harvard, I went back and I got my people and I brought them with me. Wow. Congratulations again. And thank you for shedding light on our community very inspiring. I want to talk about fear, how you break fear. Yeah. You said in the book, I went to the bottom and I learned that nothing is impossible. Yeah. So you are not afraid to fail. Yeah. You realize that, hey, I cannot achieve this. I didn't have money. This is how I, <laughs> you know, I have to face it and move forward. Maybe as a motivation to others who believe that if they are facing some type of problems in the community, that this is the end for them. When you look at the world's most successful people, they are oftentimes the people who have given themselves the opportunity to fail the most. The reason why some people have not achieved a certain level of success, the reason why many people have not achieved their goals is because they're afraid of failure. 
Um, I think I reached a point in my life, the reason why I have the tenacity that I have is because I felt like I reached the lowest of lows to the point where I realized that failure could not do anything to me that it had not already done. And, and I felt like I experienced the worst of it and I had nothing else to lose. And, and so it got to a point where I wasn't afraid of failure. Um, and, and I encourage other people to not be afraid of failure because failure is not a bad thing. In fact, I think failure gives us one of the greatest gifts that money cannot buy, and that's empathy. Empathy. It gives us the empathy to have compassion, to have grace for others. And so it's okay to fail. It's perfectly fine to fail as long as we fail forward. Ladies and gentlemen, the one and only Brendan P. Fleming here with us. Tell us in about 10 seconds, where can they find the book? Purchase the book. Yeah, Miseducated is sold. Um, everywhere books are sold. Amazon, Barnes & Noble, um, online, in a bookstore. I'm, I'm so grateful for those around the world who, who are reading this book because it's really a part of the movement. Miseducated. Thank you so much, Brendan, for being here with us. Thank you, brother. All right. Thank you as well to you for watching. This is James B. I'll see you next time for another show.